Okay, so the Apple Financial Model is now complete down to EBITDA on the income statement, and we've included revenues, expenses, uh, working capital, debtors, creditors, inventory, and we're now going to include fixed assets. Now, if you're just starting, you can download the starting model by clicking the button in the web page. Otherwise, we'd encourage you to keep going with your existing file. Now, fixed assets, uh, basically what we're referring to with fixed assets is assets that depreciate or are amortized. Now, in this course, we'll just be doing fixed assets referring to depreciating amortizing assets. We're not doing intangibles, which is what you would call an amortizing asset. Um, which, by the way, it's funny, with fixed assets, the reason why we break out intangibles is because in like the event of an insolvency, for example, um, an, an intangible event like a, a license or a, or goodwill would potentially be written off, mm-hmm. whereas a fixed asset like a you know a bit of land or, or, or a machine is probably more likely to actually get some value, so you mm-hmm. split them out. For the purposes of today, we're focusing on really how they impact the financial statements because they're very similar but for the fact that depreciation, fixed assets are depreciated, tangible assets are depreciated, intangible assets are amortised. Now, in terms of terminology, um, you know, fixed assets exist due to the matching policy. Now, the matching policy is basically that you need to expense things in line with the revenue they generate or you know, the value they create, the, the effective value they, they create for the firm. So when I think of the matching concept, I always think of the old lemonade stand example. So imagine you start a lemonade stand and you spent, say, $100 on the stand itself, and then for five years you made, say, $50 a year. Now, technically, if you didn't use the matching concept and depreciate that stand, you would literally have $100 of costs in the first year from the stand. And if, if you had no other costs, you, you'd have a $50 loss in your first year from your revenues, and then every other period you'd have a $50 profit. In actual fact, if you're getting five years value out of that stand, it's twenty dollars a year. You're getting fifty dollars of of revenue each year, so you're making thirty you're making thirty dollars of profit a year. And that matching of that hundred dollar expense is what differentiates that expense, which has multi period value from say operating expenditure, which only has value in the period in which it's incurred, like salaries and wages. So that matching of the expense to the revenue is why fixed assets exist. It's why depreciation and amortization exist, <clears throat> and it's basically why they need to be modelled separately to operating expenditure. So the difference between operating and capital expenditure is that multi-period value. Now, in terms of in terms of terminology, <clears throat> the way assets are actually recorded for accounting purposes, you obviously purchase assets at their, their book value, and then you basically write them down by the depreciation amount as you use them. And that, that, that net written down value is what refers to the value of the asset at any point in time, less it's what's called accumulated depreciation. Now, for modeling purposes, the simple formula, if you look at my screen, is your opening fixed asset balance plus your capital expenditure, which increases it, minus your depreciation equals your closing fixed assets balance. And that's the really simple formula that most 99% of models use. People don't normally forecast asset sales. They might they might forecast some asset write-offs, et cetera. But in most models, you generally start with this dynamic. And you look at it here, for example, for a single asset being depreciated over, say, a straight line, me- using the straight line method, you basically have you know an opening, assuming it was purchased at the start of the year, you purchase, like I said, the, the lemonade stand, um, and then over the, you literally you literally match it over the five years it's adding value, so your closing balance goes down linearly with straight line, um, and you end up you end up having the expense appearing on the P and L even though for cash flow purposes your cash flow of 100 comes out. So, so this is basically what we need to re- reflect in the model. Now, for this course for this course we're really focusing on the financial statement impacts of depreciation, amortization, and capex. So what we're not going to do straight line calculations. We have lots of examples on our website uh, of, 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 of things like the, the calculation of straight line and declining balance depreciation with and without waterfalls and things called reverse tickers, all sorts of complex stuff. The, the, the key to, to this course today is understanding that, that assets are recorded on the balance sheet, they're depreciated through the P&L, uh, and capital expenditure is, is reported on the cash flow statement. So if you look at Apple, it's quite challenging modeling uh, modeling fixed assets for Apple because the problem is they don't clearly say here's my capex, here's my depreciation, here's my here's my here's my written down value of my assets. They they have notes everywhere explaining what their fixed assets are. Now if you if you look at their their balance sheet, the balance sheet has property plant and equipment of of 36766 at the end of 2020, um, which is slightly lower than the year before. Um, but then if you actually go and look at say the depreciation amortization add back on the cash flow that gives you an indication of what that would be. Now, there's, there are other parts of the notes where, where basically that there is a reconciliation of their fixed assets, which is really, to be honest, quite murky. So one for the purpose of this exercise, what we're going to do is keep things simple because, you know, the, the cash flow statement PP&E structure, which, for example, they have on the cash flow statement payments for acquisition of plant property equipment, that number is quite different to what is implied when you back solve it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the closing balances for 2019 and 20, which are, are literally in the balance sheet as 
as effectively plant property and equipment net, which is net of accumulated depreciation. And we are going to say, okay, if the movement, I also took some numbers here out of 2018, which is their 2018, um, <coughs> I just took their closing balance out of the 2018 Form 10K. And I said, okay, well, if the DNA add back on the cash flow statement is correct, ignoring things like asset write-offs, revaluations, uh, you know, acquisitions, uh, all sorts of weird bits and pieces that could muddy this, you know, our indicative CapEx number, which is a plug indicative add back, um, is, is basically around about 10 and a half billion. Now, you can spend a lot of time diving into the details. That's not the point of this exercise. What we're trying to do is just get to a point where we can do some forecasts and justify them. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically assume, you know, CapEx numbers based around that implied number. Um, we've also looked at, you look at this depreciation percentage of CapEx, it's all over the shop. And this reflects all types of strange things. They may have done some acquisitions, they may have written off some assets, they may have, they may have actually built a new building, you know, which they might have done in 2009, it might have been expenditure on things like the, the infinite loop building, whatever. You know, at the end of the day, it's funny, their assets aren't a huge proportion of their revenues either, which is interesting, because they're obviously they're a widget business and they outsource a lot of their, 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 their production. So, <clears throat> so with this business, with this business, we're basically going to assume these numbers, which if we then go and, and go into our financial model, we're basically going to take that closing balance of their net PMP and we're going to ignore everything else and just take this, this 36,766. So if we go into our opening balance sheet, we're going to put that 36,766 in as our fixed assets. Now that's a non-current asset because again, yep. it's a result of CapEx. It has multi-period value. So let's go to our fixed assets in J12, which is a non-current asset on the balance sheet, and let's put in 36,766. Perfect. And straight away, balance sheet balances. We don't have closing balances. We don't have depreciation. We don't have CapEx. Now, if you look at how this is going to flow through, we've got, if you go to our forecast assumptions, we're, we're forecasting depreciation as a percentage of CapEx. Okay. And we've done that because for, for it's simple for this exercise, and also for a steady state business, that's normally pretty reliable. You can normally say for steady state businesses, you know, they, for example, by depreciating 90, by depreciation being 95% of CapEx, they're basically assuming that their assets are increasing by 5% by, by 5 of CapEx every year. It's a simplistic approach. It's not like straight line declining balance. There are examples of those on our website if you want to look at those. Um, but for the purpose of this exercise, it will enable us to show how the components of assets flow through the, flow through the financial statements. Now, if you look at these numbers and you say, okay, capital expenditure is forecast, we're, we're forecasting uh, 11 billion of CapEx in 2021. We're forecasting 95% of that uh, in CapEx, uh, sorry, 95% of that being, depreci being depreciated. Now, important to note that that doesn't mean we're depreciating 95% of that 11 bill. When you use percentage of CapEx to, 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 to forecast depreciation, you're basically saying our overall depreciation is uh, is going to be 95% of CapEx. Okay. So, for example, if, if if you had a five-year term on that CapEx, for example, you know, if you had a five-year term on that CapEx, you'd have like, say, what, 2,200? Mm -hmm. If it was at the start of the year, being depreciated of that CapEx and the remaining, the remaining what, 95%, the remainder of that 95% would actually be existing assets being depreciated. Yep. So, so it's important to note that that percentage of CapEx doesn't say we're depreciating that whole CapEx in that period. It's just a proxy. But what it does do is it gives you a relationship between your forecast capital expenditure and your forecast depreciation. And that's the key. So if you decided to throw in this model, let's assume we're going to just throw in an increase in CapEx over time. Significant increase, mm -hmm. your depreciation is going to increase, which is what you'd expect. If you were going to model things this properly and you had a major acquisition or a major investment in CapEx in, say, two years out, you would model different categories of capital expenditure and you'd have straight line and decline, straight line, but probably you might even have declining balance for tax, but you'd have straight line reflecting the life of the assets. We're just keeping it simple. The, the principles are exactly the same. So if you want to understand this, we have more advanced training on the course on access and depreciation. We also have examples where you can drill down to the formulas. Now, the key to looking at the financial statement impacts of fixed assets is just understanding that basic equation, okay? CapEx is reported on the cash flow statement as an investing cash flow mm -hmm. because it's an investment in the future. It's not operating. It doesn't burn out to drive your revenues. It, it, it drives your revenues over multiple periods, so you're investing in the future. So it, so it comes out as a cash outflow capital expenditure. That then immediately goes onto the balance sheet as an asset, but normally it's depreciated during the period. So. So, so, for example, if you acquired an asset, if you bought an asset for $100 and it was a five-year term you, and you bought it halfway through the first year, you'd have 10 depreciation in the first year and you'd have 20, 20, 20, 20, and then 10 in the final, final, final year. In this case, when you're doing percentage of CapEx, we've got CapEx of 11. We're forecasting for 21, FY21. Um, and we're saying, okay, our depreciation is going to be 9450, which is 95% of that. 
So you assume the fixed assets have increased by the 550, which is the 5% of that. No, 1054. 10, oh, sorry, 10450. Yep. And you assume that the fixed assets have increased by the difference between your capex and, and your depreciation. Yep. So it increased by 11 and then decreased. The depreciation was 10450. So overall, your fixed assets have increased by 550 during the period. Mm -hmm. But that depreciation will be a, a mulch of existing assets from your opening balance sheet and some of these capex. Okay, so... And that's, that, that's one of the examples we give in the course here. You know, if, if you actually look at that, you've got to bear in mind it's, it's a combination. That we are simplifying reality. This course to model straight line declining balance, straight line depreciation is a bit fiddly. It's a bit fiddly. So we could spend half an hour going through it. The important thing to understand here is the relationships between how fixed assets are actually modeled in a financial model. The methodologies to model it are just an extra layer, just like putting drivers on revenue. It mm -hmm. doesn't change how they're reflected in the financial statements. So let's start, by, let's start with the, capital, the, cash, the cash flow statement. And we're going to start with the cash flow statement because that's what capital expenditure is what creates fixed assets, mm -hmm. okay, or tangible assets and intangible assets. So let's go to the cash flow statement. Go to row 28, which is going to be investing cash flows. And let's just put in B28, let's just put capital expenditure. And we've just put capital expenditure assumptions in as forecast amounts. So just do equals negative and it's forecast J23. And so. negative because it's a cash outflow. Exactly. Negative because it's a cash outflow. <coughs> cool. Uh, put on there. And then we just need to include that in our investing cash flows in row 30. So in, in J30, just equal J28. That's our, only, that's our only amount at the moment. Perfect. And our balance sheet's obviously still out because we've put our, we've put our opening balance on the opening balance sheet. Mm -hmm. We've put our capex. We still need to put our closing balances and our depreciation. Okay, so let's go. In this case, again, we're doing stuff in a strange order because what you would normally do, excuse me, what you'd normally do with assets is you'd model the T account balances in an output sheet and then you'd link through the output, the opening, the closing balance, the depreciation, the capex through the financials. Again, because we're trying to make this course efficient, we're going to model, we're going to put capex in the cash flow statement, depreciation in the, in the income statement, and then we're going to calculate the closing balance as equal to the opening balance plus capex minus depreciation. Cool. So let's go back to the income statement. In, I think it's in 2A. Two, two and let's go, you'll see between EBITDA and EBIT, obviously the difference between those is DNA, depreciation amortization. So let's put depreciation amortization. I think we use the US spelling here. Depreciation and amortization. And and this formula is just really simply, this is obviously we've dodged the bullet here by using percentage of CapEx. Yes. So this is equals, well, we can just do this straight off the uh, forecast assumptions, equals negative because the assumptions are positive. And we want this to be a negative number. So equals forecast J23. So equals the capital expenditure. Forecast CapEx multiplied by the 95% the percent depreciation percentage of CapEx. Fantastic. And that gives us our, <coughs> that gives us our negative uh, 10450. 10, 10, in line with that. And then we just need to include that in EBIT. So adjust the EBIT figure. So it equals 16 and 17. And that's going to make sure. So then, well, then we have EBITDA. EBIT equals EBITDA minus DNA. So it's the sum of these two. Some of those two. Again, we can just sum because they're all negative numbers, positive and negative numbers. Perfect. And now the only reason our balance sheet's not balancing is because we don't have it on the balance sheet yet. Okay, so that will be flowing through. That depreciation will be flowing through net profit after tax into retained profits. Mm -hmm. um, the cash flow statement capex will be flowing through the change in cash into the balance sheet cash uh, and into the current assets. So we just need to go to our balance sheet now and get that feeling back of having a balance sheet that's not unbalanced. Perfect. So we need to go to our so we need to go to our balance sheet and our fixed assets are going to be in row 20, 20. which is under a non-current asset. We're just going to fixed assets and this formula this formula here is going to say if it's the first period. So what we're doing here is we're taking the prior period, we're adding capex, removing depreciation. Mm -hmm. Now capex is a negative number on our cash flow statement, which means we're going to have to subtract it because it's already negative. Yep. Um, the income statement depreciation is already negative, so we just add that. So it's a bit confusing. So first of all, let's get the prior period. So the prior period in the first period is equal to the opening balance sheet number. So equals if J$17, the period number, equals 1, one. Yep. then go to the opening balance sheet and just equal the fixed assets balance there. Yep, mm -hmm. J, uh, dollars J12. And Otherwise, dollars. so comma, we just want the prior period on the balance sheet. Cool. So back to the balance sheet. Balance and sheet and it's I20. And get rid of it now. Horrible Show bit. reference. I twenty, cool. right? And you can press enter on that if you want for a sec. Go. Cool. So that's going to give us our opening balance sheet. There mm -hmm. you go. And if you and if you copy that across, it would obviously do nothing after that because it would just stay flat, right? Yep. So so we need to we need to add. So from that now in the first period, we now need to add capex and subtract depreciation. So to the end of that, 
subtract the negative capex, so negative cash flow statement capital expenditure. Mm -hmm. So negative the capex, yep, because it's already negative, so that's going to add the 11, and then add the expense on the income statement, which is already negative, so add J17 on the income statement, which is the appreciation amortization, yep. and that will give you the what's called the, the net written down value of that. Mm -hmm. And it's still not balancing because we haven't included it in total assets. In, yep. So we need to include in total non-current assets. So equal non-current assets to there. Um, so yeah, so we're going and putting equals J20 in row 22. Copy that across and boom, balance sheet balances again. So, <coughs> so, the, so, the bear, so with fixed assets, the most important thing is you need to include them in the model so that your actual earnings aren't impacted by CapEx being OpEx. I think some companies like Enron and Wellcom I think at times confused OPEX and CAPEX and other, <laughs> other things on the income statement. In reality, anything which has multi-period benefit, you need to spread the cost. And that's done via depreciation or with intangibles via, uh, via, via amortization. The, the movement, ignoring things like asset write-offs and revaluations, the movement is equal to, in fixed assets, is equal to its increase due to CAPEX and its decrease due to DNH period. Um, and then there's a whole other layer of complexity with regards to straight line decline. Straight line declining balance aren't complicated once you get the hang of them. You just need to learn how to write the formulas. Mm -hmm. But the way they hit the financial statements, increase capex going through cash, um, and then inc decrease by depreciation, and then the net written down value on your balance sheet will always hold true. Mm -hmm. And now your Apple model now contains fixed assets and is now complete down to EBIT.